Well, hello, White Sox fans, and welcome to another edition of the Future Sox podcast. My name is Ian Eskridge. I am joined this evening by James Fox. How are you, James? I'm great, Ian. How's it going, man? I'm doing well. Um, so great uh, news that just came across the wire a few hours ago is that Noah Schultz is being bumped to double A. Good stuff. Your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, look, he just like we we kind of said that he just needed innings regardless of where they were. And I think you had kind of made a lot of comments about how nobody in high A can hit him anyway. So let's get those innings in double. That's I think it's fine. Yeah. Uh, so th the thing being is that the kids got a point nine one whip in advanced day. So if you aren't getting the competitive needs that you have there, even if he is just being slated as four innings per start, uh, it makes sense to me to, to bump him up if that's indeed the case, you know, um, it just seems like a, a logical move to, to bump him up there. In my opinion, you know, uh, you're, you think that it's aggressive or do you think it's the, do you think that's the right move? No, I think it's fine. I think they just, I, I think they do want him more challenged at some point than he has been. And he's just not, and I, obviously he's given up some runs, but nobody's hit him at all. So I, I don't know what it means. I guess like going forward, like, do you think this makes it any more likely that he's closer to the majors than we thought? Like maybe like mid season 2025, or does it not really matter? Huh. Uh, you know, I don't think it really matters. Uh, you know, we've talked, you know, a, a, like you had mentioned earlier with the innings and him needing to get innings. I I personally don't want to see the, uh, the, the Chris sale thing, you know, where they bring him up as a reliever. Uh, personally, I just don't want to see it. I just kind of want him to hop straight into his role, but and I certainly don't want him anywhere around the buffoon at 35th and Shields. So, um, yeah, that's just my kind of my, my thoughts on it is that I'd rather just see him in a starting role. And if they were to skip Charlotte for him and they feel that next year is the year to kind of ramp him up and and bump him up, you know, quickly. I don't have a problem with that at all, as long as the as long as it makes sense, I guess. Yeah, I guess the. I'm curious to see what happens elsewhere now, just with like the rest of the, because I know like we talk a lot off air about like all the pitchers, pitchers that, that they have, have. Um, like, like who's going, going where, where, you know, you know like, like this, 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 do a couple, couple guys, guys go to Charlotte, Charlotte because, because of this, this like do some, some, does somebody, somebody go from Canada to Winston? Winston? So I think so the, the next, next move will be interesting. interesting. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the, the chain reaction of him getting bumped is one of those things. And, and somebody asked in the, uh, that baseball tossed asked, uh, thoughts on Schultz promotion. And do you expect Thorpe to now go to Charlotte? And, you know, me and you have had this conversation off stream that it seems like the next step in things I would think, you know, um, I know that, uh, Oh, Drew says that you are echoing, Odd. Um, let me see if I can figure. Yeah, yeah I, can I can hear, hear it, it too, too, but, but I, didn't I didn't think, think anybody. anybody else did. Hmm. Interesting. Let me. Um... Hmm. Do you have uh so, you, so your speakers aren't on currently? I take it at all. Um. No. no. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I don't know what that. Uh, I don't know what's causing that because I don't have that on in my area. Um. So. The uh, as far as the the Thorpe thing goes, it, it seems like that seems to be the next logical thing 
I don't know what Drew Thorpe necessarily has to prove at double A. Um, you know, I, he did have a outing, his second outing of the week. Um, why does it keep doing that? Um, he had a, a start last, what was that? Uh, one week ago on Sunday, and it was his second start of the week, and there was an issue with um, very high pitch count in that first inning of his second start of the week. And uh, this week, his start, the first inning, was also a very stressful inning. He got up to, I think he got through the inning, but I think it was in 32 pitches or 31 pitches in the first inning this week. And uh, after that, once he got out of that first inning, it was, it was back to normal and just uh one, two, three inning, one, two, three inning, you know, and not much of a problem. So um, it seems like the next logical step from, for, you know, my thoughts, but uh, you know, Anybody's guess is, you know, <laughs> as good as mine, I suppose, because uh, there has been no clarification from anybody as to what's going on. So, well, I mean, I kind of feel like anybody from that rotation could go to Charlotte and it would be fine. Yeah. Thorpe seems that's... to be next. Andy's on the 40, though. Yeah. I had seen somebody make a, a comment on Twitter, which, you know, you know, it's Twitter. But, uh, you know, somebody had mentioned about Kai Bush being the next one to move to AAA just simply because of his age, which, you know, is a, a fairly relevant concern. Uh, and he has been f fantastic so far this year. Uh, so maybe that is a, is that, you know, maybe that is a consideration. I don't, I don't really know. Yeah, I mean, so he's not on the 40 man. So to get him to the big leagues, you'd the roster move, but like yeah, obviously going to Charlotte doesn't really matter. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that that's the age old concern here is are we really worried about anybody actually getting sent to Charlotte? I don't think so. Eater, maybe. Like I you know, like maybe him, like when you deem him ready, you just call him straight to the big leagues. But like the way Drew Thorpe pitches, I'm not really worried about him pitching at Charlotte. Yeah. Yeah, me either. I mean, I'm not per se, like, I'm not really worried about any of them. It's just, you know, there has to be a known thing from everybody that it's just, if somebody's going to Charlotte, expect pop flies that are going to end up being you know, <laughs> that are going to go out just yeah. because, you know, like not Yankee because. Stadium? Jesus. <laughs> yeah, those those home runs, uh, that John Birdie home run was terrible. And uh, that uh, was Aaron Judge home run as yeah, well. Yeah, the Judge Same one thing. was crazy. Yeah, I think the John, John Birdie one was like two rows deep. So. Corey Jolks ended up pulling that one back, although granted that was to to left field and not to right field, but even yeah. still. Are you surprised at all how quickly they pull the plug on Keller? Because I just, like it shouldn't, I mean it shouldn't be a surprise. He stinked, but I didn't know if he like had extra rope because of his relationship with Pedro. At this point, I mean, you know my feelings on Pedro, obviously, but uh at this point, if if they are asking for his opinion on personnel moves, well, then what are we doing? You know, I mean, it's it's bad enough that you've got Gene Watson and you know you got all these Kansas City guys all over the place. I don't want their personnel moves. Uh, I will say though that the pro scouting department has been doing it seems to be, have been doing a pretty decent job this year of evaluating guys that they're bringing in at least in the fact that they're getting useful you know reps from s at least some of these guys and, and a pretty decently high percentage of guys as well so yeah for sure even like the Corey Jolks move 
like the roster turn. Like this is something that I've wanted to see. They didn't do this like back in 2019. They would just have the same like Gilmer Sanchez and Adam Engel, and they'd never claim anybody that was the so like they should keep doing this. Just keep giving people a shot. Um and see if anything sticks. Like I'm I'm totally fine with this, you know. So the trade that they made this week for their, I mean, obviously I do our international stuff. Uh, Luis Rodriguez, um, I, I kind of told somebody to just pretend like that trade was for cash. So he, he's like a low 90s reliever. I don't think they're going to regret that one. Um, and if you think that jokes can help you get through the season or whatever, I think I just think deals like this are fine. Yeah, that's the thing. You know, like I went back and – he's a, a DSL and an ACL guy only. And if you look at his whip, his whip hasn't been great. If you look at his write up, uh, I think it said some, some, something said something about, uh, him dominating the ACL or whatever with, with, uh, his cutter or whatever pitch it was. And I'm like, okay, you can, you can say that, but if if he dominated, why does he have like a one one point nine whip? You know, like come on, man. Yeah, that to me, that trade was kind of you get somebody that's going to be useful to the major league team this year and wants to play. Fine, and he seems motivated. You know that catch he made in the outfield today was fantastic. Yeah, and he's going to get the opportunity to play, and if he stinks, they'll get rid of him too and make another similar deal probably. Yeah, just keep on doing it, you know, and it goes goes down to that roster churn thing. Uh, you know, the, the question being is that, you know, what we're finally getting some useful outfielders out there. Are we still going to continue to see Gavin Sheets and, you know, trot it out there? It's that, that whole thing's still maddening, and he's – you know, I was yeah. thinking earlier this year that maybe he had gotten a little bit better out there, but it's still like way, way, way below replacement value. Well, his offense now is cratering too again. Like he's turning Shocking. back into Gavin Sheet. I know. Yeah. It's like we. Ooh. Well, did you hear the comments from Eloy today? Like I just, with this guy, like I just, like he kind of talked about he's still not comfortable as a D. He'd rather be killed. And it's like, dude, like we, like we can't play with. What are you talking about? I would prefer to be a multimillionaire. Alas, I am not. You are not a right fielder. You are not an outfielder at all. I am sorry to, you know, to uh, break the news to you, pal, but uh, you're a DH. That's what you are. Sorry. Yeah, I have to agree with you on that, Doug. Trade was fine. Enough pitching. Need some outfielders. Need some bats in general, I think. Uh, speaking of trades, uh, something that I knew that you wanted to bring up. There's actually a couple of things that you've been uh, stirring the pot on on the Twitter that I want to talk about mm. a little bit tonight. But the, John uh, Shriven talk? Here we go, he, baby. Absolutely. I need to have a little bit of that from you because it's... Uh, Did you see that I was... A I'm a loser in beef's column. Oh boy, here we go. Which what why why come? <laughs> What's up? Well, no, he said that I don't know, he put one of my tweets in there and said that I was one of the losers cuz I defended 670 or something. I was like that's fine. Yeah, I mean, whatever. <laughs> the whole thing I'm just kind of like I I I don't really have like a rooting interest at all. I just think like the whole thing in general is fairly entertaining. Yeah, it's very so, strange. It really is. Like I don't uh, get either I don't get either side the other night. Um like I totally understand criticizing John Schriffen because he's a public figure and a, as you've kind of said, like he's a slam ball announcer in Market 3. Um so like I get it, right? But I don't get like freaking out challenging him on Twitter when I guess you could just have like your host do it or whatever. That was the part that it got kind of a little bit blown out of proportion, but you know, I'm sure, I'm sure it's not going away anytime soon. 
I think that, well, I, this happened before the weekend. So now the weekend's almost officially over. So tomorrow they finally get back on the air again tomorrow. So I'm really interested to see where that whole thing goes on the uh, Parkins and Spiegel show, just to, just to see which direction it, it heads in. Uh, I know that you, uh, you tweeted out the house of L podcast that Lawrence put out earlier. Yes. Uh, thanks for the future socks shout out. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, and you know, he's going to get, you know, I'm sure that they're going to get dragged into that whole thing as well. You and I think, think so. he kind of intimated into that in that episode that he's probably going to get dragged a little bit into that tomorrow when they have their first show and <laughs> we'll see where this whole thing goes. It, it could get yeah. kind of weird. Well, so I guess like the one thing I wanted to say just that like, I don't care. I don't care who I get lumped in with or whatever. Like I think a lot of people that follow me know that I listen to a lot of sports radio um, mostly 670, but I mean, I went on White Sox Weekly Saturday morning and talked yes, about you did. and talked about prospects. Like I like those guys too. I just like the thing that's unfair are the people that are like, that's the Cubs station. They never talk socks because it's not true. Like at all. They talk, they talk socks a lot and there's not much to talk about, but I mean, and there's like, nothing good to say. There's either. not. And like Lawrence and Dan's show, they have vegan on. They have the Sox Machine guys on. They have Russell Dorsey on to talk Sox like quite a bit. Like Gian's on the morning show. And Matt Spiegel would talk baseball all the time if Danny Parkins would let him, you know. Like it's just they would talk Sox all the time. Yeah, no, it's uh, I you know, I have it on in the background at work in my office, and uh I hear Sox conversation. I mean, granted, I hear seventy five percent Bears conversation because they say it it, you know, does ratings, which, you know, how, you know, after hearing the same arguments for nine hours a day, I don't understand how that's a thing, but I mean, they do talk white Sox, and they, you know, they don't talk an absurdly, you know, an absurd amount of Cubs on there either. So I, that whole argument at this point, I think is kind of, kind of moot, you know, the white Sox being bad, the Cubs are okay, but they have their issues as well. They're not really talking either one of those teams to a uh, a crazy level at all. So yeah. I don't see the argument there. Well, I mean, like you have shows like ours, which Lawrence Holmes kind of talked about tonight, right? Like if you want White Sox centric content, it's available. Like our show is on right now. Nick's recording live right now. There's guys on all week, and they're all pretty good. Like there, that's, you know, like if you were the PD or even the executive producer of like an afternoon radio show in Chicago right now, like, would you recommend your host talks white sex? No, no, that's no, what I probably mean. Not. Like it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't move the meter at all. So it's bear, it's bears, which is frustrating for probably non bears fans like you. And like, look, it's not football season, but it moves the meter, man. And you know, the Bulls are terrible, the Hawks are terrible, and it's all Cubs talk otherwise. So, I mean, like, they don't really have much of a choice. Yeah, no, I, you can't you can't push the Sox talk because there's not really a whole lot worth talking about. So it makes sense that the percentages are kind of down. And not to mention, you know, in general, White Sox, you know, amount of fandoms here, you know, like they're kind of – you know, right. 65, 35 against the Cubs anyway. So mm -hmm. maybe 60, 40, you know? Yeah. Pull, can you pull up that tweet or the, uh, the message from Doug? I, I kind of want to address that actually. Oh, sure. Yeah. I was going to bring that up. So I guess just like full disclosure here, this man has been on our show before. So he's talking about Jack McMullen, who's the triple A play guy for the Indianapolis Indians. And I think Jack, it's going to be a big league broadcaster at some point. Um, did I think that he was or should have been the favorite for the White Sox job in Market 3? No, not necessarily. But I'm fairly certain that he's more qualified than the guy they hired. Like, he just is. You know, and there's Joe Brand is in town. He's doing Hawk stuff. He's done thousands of Kane County games, right? Like, these guys are young, and they've done baseball. So if this was the route you were going to go, one of those guys makes perfect sense. And it just, 
It didn't happen. I don't know if that's why Spiegel has gone after John as much as he has. I, I'm not going to speak for him. I don't know. But, I mean, if it were Jack McMullen, you know, you got a white guy that grew up in, like, one area. Makes a heck of a lot more sense than what they're doing right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not a, a huge Schriffen detractor. Uh, but I can see how people don't like him. And I can also understand why it kind of is one of those things where it feels like there's kind of training wheels on the broadcast. You know, it's just that he's not, he's not ready for like this level of baseball broadcasting in my personal opinion, you know, I, th and, and you know, if, if they wanted to go internal and wanted somebody that was going to be, you know, specifically for the white Sox and they wanted to keep it, you know, in the family, they could have gone down to Charlotte and got Swyrad or, uh, or Pacheco, you know, or Kurt Bloom, who's done a game for them as well. I mean, they could have done a bunch of things and this is what they decided on. He's excitable. He's got some flair, but the problem being is that he doesn't know the game as well as he should. Well, and do, so. you, do you think that they're intentionally doing like the Hawk Harrelson thing, like the us against the world thing? Like calling out the haters, like I just or is this just what he's doing? Like, does he think he should do this because it's a local broadcast and that's what we do, or is this kind of what they want to be? I don't, I can't really tell you. Yeah, I don't know. I I kind of don't think that they're smart enough to build this us against them type thing. Like, I I don't, I honestly don't think that that's what it is. Just because I don't think that they have the forethought to, to do something like that. Even if they were, don't you think that they would pick somebody that at least knows the game of baseball really well? Right. Like they don't, they don't care enough. They didn't even make sure he said Bill Vex name correctly. Like, I don't think anything about this is planned out or anything. They're just, you know, it's just whatever. Nobody, nobody's watching. Nobody will notice basically, you know? Yeah. Until he, says radio losers and then goes viral on Twitter, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I do actually, I have a question for you and this is like completely off topic. Uh, yeah. Your microphone, when you click on the microphone, does it, which are you using the headset mic or are you using the, uh, the, the desktop mic? That's what I'm wondering. That might be the, uh, the weird issue possibly. Oh, I'm using my external microphone. Hmm. I don't know then. This one. Okay. I know All it's right. weird. Fair enough. Uh, they said that the double back is the, uh, the, the doubler is gone. So that at least that part's good. Uh, so moving along to other things that you've set off in motion on Twitter, <laughs> uh, Luis Robert has been mentioned by Jeff Passan as being a trade of trade interest to the Seattle Mariners. Your thoughts on that? Um, well, I think it's the right team. I'd be pretty surprised if, um, he got moved in season. I think we've talked about that. I just, I don't know. I don't really, I don't really see, it. but I do think that's the type of team that could do like the Nationals Juan Soto type grade, you know, like they have, they got a ton of position players. I think nine of their top 10 prospects are position players. Now we're talking like if it's, if it's, if it's them. I think they could make a deal. Now, that doesn't mean they would, because I think right now, if we went through trade packages, it's going to be absurd. Like the return's going to be crazy, you know. So it would. I just. I don't know. I. I would bet against him being traded. I do think it's interesting that it was passing up. Yeah, that was that was the kind of thing that made me take notice. Is you know, had it been just somebody random bringing it up i'd have been like yeah okay but for the fact that this is a very well connected guy coming up and bringing this up it seems like a uh a very odd just kind of thing to just pop up on twitter you know just seems to me that it's it's kind of weird that now while he's still injured that Jeff Passon's bringing this up. 
it just seems like kind of a weird time to be bringing that whole thing up. Well, for sure. And I did say what, like I had heard last week that there, I mean, they'd trade anybody. It doesn't mean they're going. To. I just, I just think like in the position that they're in, they have to at least like kind of think about it or listen, but there's only a handful of teams in baseball that could trade for Lewis Robert. And there's, and those teams probably half of them wouldn't even be interested. Yeah. And not to mention, you know, we're also looking at a guy who, you know, I saw somebody refer to him as Byron Buxton in reply to, uh, mm-hmm. to your tweet there. And I was like, yeah, that kind of tracks, you know, both of them are oft injured center fielders that have all the potential in the world. Um, it's just a question of will either one of them ever be healthy for a full, you know, for a full entire season. Yeah, for sure. And look, if, if the White Sox people, Chris Getz, um, Gene Watson, whoever, if they feel like Luis Robert isn't going to ever be able to stay healthy consistently, then I think they probably trade him. Yeah. I just, we don't, we just, we don't know that. Yeah, no, that's for sure. And like the, also the thing being that do they just want to get rid of that entire core of players? You know, we know Eloy has gone. We know Mankata is going to be gone. All of that pitching has gone except for Kopech. And he's probably going to get moved this trade deadline as a, you know, lockdown closer. If everything goes to plan here, um, you know, the only one that would be really left is Luis Robert, and they still have him under control for so long that they should be able to, you know, assuming that the other team does see the value and believes in the fact that they can keep him healthy, then, you know, maybe they're willing to give some decent return on that package. Although I don't know with the risk that has been with his health, I don't know if they're going to be willing to part with as much as everybody thinks. Yeah, I would agree there. And I don't know how like he should be back pretty soon. I think I, my guess is we hear deadline rumor seems to be interested, but nothing really moves. And then it becomes like a December winter meeting thing. Yeah. I mean, the, we've got what, uh, 25, 26, we got, uh, three and a half years of control for, for Robert. Right. Yeah. So you're going to have to get some massive return mm-hmm. because if he does stay healthy, they're going to get huge, you know, return on that. But the thing that you have to figure out is you're going to have to find somebody that believes that he's going to be that or is willing to at least give you enough decent amount of value back that you're willing to take the discount on moving him out just because you don't think that he's going to be healthy. You know what I'm right. saying? They're willing exactly. to take that risk on his health. So. Yeah, I think it's kind of like, and they cannot do this for Robert, but like the trade with the Mariners for Gregory Santos, right? I think at first blush, it's like, oh, that's not enough in return. And I think the primary point of that was to get the extra draft pick and the extra bonus pool money and we'll see what they do with that in July um, but I think they kind of baked in the fact that they didn't think Gregory Santos was going to be able to help them yeah and uh, now none of well I mean Deloach hit his second home run today so that was nice uh, Perlander Barrow had a scoreless inning today which was also nice but I mean I'm not going to you know split hairs here and say that it's a hundred percent a lopsided deal. Granted, they haven't gotten anything out of Santos, uh, but you know, we haven't gotten a whole lot of great production out of Baroa and Zach Deloach has been, you know, like kind of middle of the road. So it's not like either one's, you know, blowing up on either side. So uh, let's, you know, let's hope if we, see him traded that we're going to get some great value back. But uh, at this point, this early in his contract, I don't know if that's necessarily going to happen. Yeah, for sure. And and I will say like, so just like back to the Mariners idea, like Colt Emerson was one of their high school picks last year. He's been really good. Colt, another young shortstop. They got a lot of guys like that. 
So it is a lot of bats. Um, so something based around three to four bats, a young pitcher with control. I mean, that's, I mean, pretty good. I just don't know that Seattle is going to be willing to do that, like a year's trade deadline. And, you know, I feel like in the offseason they could get beat if that's what it ends up being. Yeah, I, I like Cole Young a lot. I like Colt Emerson a lot. Uh, Lazaro Montes also been very good. I mean, there's, there are, there are so many names Colt, you know, like the, there, there are so many names that they have in their top 10 that I do like and, uh, would certainly be interested in. I just don't know how many they're going to be willing to give away for Luis Robert, knowing that, you know, you might get a hundred games out of him a year. You know, is it worth, how much is that worth? You know, how much is his time worth? Especially when you look at the first couple of weeks that he put up this year and the return on, you know, like the, the numbers that he was putting up really aren't all that special. So, you know, we'll see. It's going to be interesting. Yeah. I just, there's lots of other guys that are going to get traded before we, talk about a Louis Robert trade, right? And it's that's the first thing I thought of when I kind of saw the the Keller thing that it would put forth like a bunch of other moves. And I'm like, oh I wonder if they traded somebody, but it doesn't seem like it. Yeah, I don't think so. Uh you know, I think uh James Fegan alluded to the fact that it was a response move to uh, Dominic Leone coming back from the IL and them wanting to keep Schuster in the bullpen. So that's why they're getting yeah. rid of Keller. But I feel like I so. would I would keep Soroka in the bullpen too. Oh, yeah. He yeah. threw 97 the other day. Yeah. So you're going to put that guy back in the rotation for what reason? I don't – yeah, I don't buy that. I don't know. And if, and if they are and the – my answer would be, what's the reason would be that they're dumb. <laughs> that, yeah, that would be the only thing. Even, like if you think you're going to trade Mike Soroka for like a C minus prospect, right? Are you more likely to get that guy with him starting and having a five ERA or transitioning him to relief and maybe his stuff plays up? Yeah. I, I mean, Personally, I kind of think that Soroka is only going to be useful as a bullpen arm. And the only thing that anybody's going to want or trust is if he's throwing 97 miles an hour, you know, coming out of the pen and only able to, you know, maybe go a couple of innings. Like a, a contender can use somebody like that, you know, in a mop-up role if they are trying to uh, conserve innings on the rest of their, you know, like say on their starting staff or whatever. If you got somebody that can come, come out and throw two innings and you cut somebody off at five innings and, you know, he goes six and seven, like that's a, a huge bridge thing and allows you to save, you know, your, your starting pitching. So, you know, as you're going into the playoffs and stuff like that, that I totally get. Um, as a starter, I don't really see the the value there unless he's throwing hard again because you know him in the starter role this year has not been great. It's not been terrible, but uh, it seems a lot better coming out of the pen. Yeah, I was kind of surprised because he's like the type of guy who I didn't really know that his stuff would play up at all in the pen. I'm like, is he just going to be like a mop up guy? But his stuff was actually a lot better. So it was a little bit surprising. It was, yeah. Brebbia hasn't pitched in five day uh, five days. IL and call up Nastrini. I mean, it could be Nastrini at some point. Like if they just like add him to the rotation, I wouldn't be that surprised. I I don't know that he's like earned a spot in the rotation, but I'd rather watch him every five days than Brad Keller. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Like that that DFA is. I am a okay with that DFA. Um, yeah, that's so. Are are you? You know, Beeflo actually tweeted about this last week that if he had his 
choice, he would rather see either Mason Adams or Drew Thorpe in Chicago than Nestrini or Cannon. Just, I, I would assume, because he he thinks that the upside's a little bit higher. Uh, you have any thoughts on that? No, I just think, I mean, look, I'm I'm going to trust Brian Banister at this point. I mean, I feel like adding an Adam to the 40-man right now doesn't really make that much sense, like the last season. Yeah. Um, but if it's four, for just like one start, because they want to get a look at him, he's on the 40-man. Like that, I would understand, right? Even if like, all of a sudden Jake Eater's making his big league debut, you know, just because they want to see. He's 26 years old. He's on the 40-man. Those moves make more sense to me than, like, prematurely on the guy, you know, like, before they're ready. The Jason could hold his own. I just – it just doesn't really seem necessary. I think. Yeah. And this – this these situations that keep on coming up, it really shows you what a mess – they made out of the 40 man roster and just the, the amount of moves that have to be made just to make something simple happen. You know, it's, it's absurd (laughs) to even that they even have to consider, you know, shuffling all the, you know, deck chairs on the Titanic, I guess, just to try and bring more talent up to the roster. It's pretty, pretty awful. Yeah, and another, I mean, I don't know how much you were going to get into performances, but like Iriarte is on the 40, man. He had 13 more strikeouts today. So I think he has 46 Ks in like 33 innings or something this year. So I don't know. I don't really see the uh, relief concerns that some had. Uh, I mean, I can see it. Uh, It's kind of one of those things where um, sometimes – he looks like, oh, yeah, that's why they say that there's relief concerns. Uh, but it usually is like one start and then it's gone. Yeah, like eight walks one time. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's that's when you see yeah. that, you know, oh, yeah, I could see why they say that, oh, there's some relief concern there. But then there's games like today where, you know, he goes uh, seven innings and, you know, one walk and f- 14 strikeouts, mm-hmm. you know, insane. So, in Birmingham. In Birmingham. Yeah, that's a, a really good baseball. And they're getting yeah. Local. Yeah. So if they're yeah. not going to send somebody to Charlotte, I'm curious what they do. Because so like Schultz has been a Saturday night starter, you know, as like in like a college role, basically. He's going four innings every Saturday night. So if they keep him on that schedule, it does affect some of the other guys in that rotation kind of. Yeah. We had this talk, uh, off air sort of, um, so we have several options here because I, you know, they're adding, a a six starter. So then there'll be, you know, if they don't move anybody, then they've got six guys and everybody's got their day and Noah Schultz can take Saturday. Like he has been, and they can shuffle everybody else around so there's six guys in the rotation. Uh, unfortunately, that takes six. the sixth man, that Saturday game, takes him out of Winston-Salem, so now they're at five. So, you know, they could move... Uh, they could move, you know, either Jose Ramirez or... Uh, Shane uh, Murphy, Shane Murphy, to the rotation, and still have one piggyback, I guess. Or, you know, maybe they feel that Jose Ramirez is ready for Double A, or they feel somebody else in Winston is ready for Double A. They move him up with Schultz as a piggyback, and then they give Shane Murphy or whoever the other day. So there's still six starters in Winston. I mean, regardless, they're going to figure out a way to get this whole thing done. Uh, just, we, we just wait to find out how they want to lay out the rotations. If they want to have it as one start every week, or if they want to have it. So every once in a while, there's a guy that has two starts a week. Right. Cause that's what was happening at some point. Like somebody would go Tuesday and then that guy would also throw something. 
you know? Right. So do you yeah, have any issue? Sex, right? So do you have any issue with guys just starting once a week? Or would you prefer to see that where it's just you stay in rotation and somebody goes twice a week? I don't personally have a problem with it. Uh, as long as uh, we're not pulling the plug too short on some of these, uh, you know, cover some of these innings, you know, like I, 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 I don't like it when, you know, I mean, obviously with Schultz, it's a completely different scenario, but like some of these other guys where you're pulling them at like 75 pitches and like five innings or whatever, I don't want to see that anymore. If they're only pitching once a week, you know? Right. Uh, here's a question. Yeah. I mean, it, so it could be him or, but it could be any number of guys. I kind of feel like, I mean, like that could be Keener. Keener. Keener doesn't belong in the way. Lucas Gordon doesn't belong in the way. Um, obviously, Grant Taylor is there now. So yeah, somebody could move, but I feel like it could be any number of those guys. Yeah. I mean, what happens uh, to the Winston rotation now? They could just slide Murphy into it if they wanted, and then they don't need anybody. Yeah, I mean, he pitched four innings the other day something like that and had like seven strikeouts. So, I mean, yeah. he was great in canny last year. I don't see any reason that like, and like he comes in out of a, out of rehab in Arizona and he just glides right into an advanced day. You'd never know that he hadn't pitched an advanced day before. He just came in and just started striking people out left and right and throwing up zeros on the, on the yeah. scoreboard. So well, but then they also added Taylor to Canny, and they didn't do anything to accommodate, right? They didn't. They didn't bump anybody up. They did. They well, they didn't bump anybody up. They just took Bach instead and uh, made him like a piggyback guy. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, Bach instead could go back in the rotation if somebody, you know, but he's Derek Keener or somebody goes to Winston. Because I yep. think it to me it seems like the spots are in shadow. Um you know, like two or three guys could go from Birmingham to Charlotte and then you could just like filter up kind of, but it just doesn't seem like they feel like doing that yet. Yeah. Yeah. That's the whole thing is that I don't know if they have like some arbitrary date set where they're like, okay, this is one, you know, this is when we're going to start moving everybody mm -hmm. around because they moved, uh, moved Noah Schultz in pretty quick. They did. But how much, how much do you think they're considering winning the Southern league title? I mean, they haven't won in a long time, so I, right. Like, and I think you you may think it matters more than I think it matters, but I mean, if you don't want some of these guys in Charlotte or you don't think it matters, then I could see just leaving them in Birmingham and trying to be the best team in the Southern League. Got to win a championship somewhere, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, look like four is not going to be in double-A all year. But if nope. Mason Adams and Iriarte and some of these other guys are, like, I wouldn't be that surprised. They just, they really just need innings. Yeah, and, you know, like, I kind of feel like if you're going to take a guy out of the Birmingham rotation, I don't think it's going to make a difference. Right. Because this team, this, this organization in general is so deep in pitching that at least at the double A level, I feel like no matter what they, you know, like who they pick out right now, that they could fill the slot and it would be no problem. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know who the most deserving it Thor probably because he's great, but I mean, like Kai Bush probably earned it too. Kai Bush has been really good. Yeah. He's been, he's been real. Uh, it, and, you know, this is the whole thing, you know, where people just were not happy with return on trades last year and were just complaining to complain, you know, and the same thing goes for Eater, you know, Kai Bush, Edgar Caro was like, he looked okay, you know, like they, they were mostly happy, you know, they were mostly happy with him, you know, but when it came to like all the returns on the trades, everybody was super critical about the return on the trades. So yeah, he's looked great. 
<laughs> yeah. Amazing what happens when you don't have a lat injury, you know? Yeah, I know we've been we've been kind of talking about this every week, but Kenny, Rick, whoever it was, they found the sucker at the table last year with Artie Marino. That Angels trade looks pretty good, you know. And Caro, if you look at Caro's numbers in May, they're not great. But they're like not. that happened. It happened, you know, right? So he could very easily just go back to his April numbers in June and then everything's fine, you know. So but getting both of those guys for two guys that you weren't keeping, that's pretty good. Yeah, I'm not complaining about I, I literally not complaining about any of the trades that were made last year. Uh I mean if you look at if you look at Berger's numbers since he's come back from his uh his IL stint, he hasn't been doing a whole lot. And yeah, he had a decent run last year after he was traded, but I mean you know, what was he gonna do on this White Sox team anyway? What was he gonna provide? Somebody who can't play third base but hits 30 home runs a year. I mean, that's cool. But if you can trade him and get something that's potentially a frontline starter left-handed that could be fantastic, you should take that chance. This is exactly the kind of time that you should take a chance like that because this team was going nowhere anyway, and I'm pretty sure they knew that. So, Yeah, I mean, Berger right now is like trending toward a non-tender. Because I think he's the type of guy where pre-arb, you like having him on your team because there's no reason not to, right? But once he starts costing real money, those are the guys that are tough to keep just because it's just not that valuable. Because there's no defensive value, and they don't get on bait. They give you just, you know, like the White Sox just signed one of those guys in Charlotte. And I know, like, nobody wants to hear that. But like, Jared Walsh, it's like that's there's these guys are all over the place. Yeah, Jared Walsh had, you know, more success than Jake Berger did, I would probably say, you know, and uh, he couldn't find a job. So at least uh, relatively close to the amount of, uh, you know, success that that he had Mm -hmm. anyway. So um, obviously, like, one other thing that happened this week, you watched Grant Taylor pitch. in Kannapolis and kind of right away had some takeaways. So, you know, just, I guess, your uh, your thoughts on that. I, like, I interviewed that kid and loved him, and I just, like, watched. Um, well, I didn't, well, I didn't watch. So I looked at, like, the stats from Arizona, talked to people that have seen him, and there was rave review, were rave reviews. Um, but now we're going to have video. Yeah. Um so he made a couple of bad pitches. That's it. There was a couple of bad pitches. Everything else, uh, you know, everything else was great other than those couple of pitches. I think he hung like one slider or something like that, and it got hammered. I'll take that. <laughs> Thanks, Beef. Uh, yeah, so, uh, no, he looked great. Um, composed on the mound. Awesome. You know, the velocity was great. Uh, the movement on the pitches, you know, the profile of the pitches. Awesome. Um, he's pretty much everything that I hope that he would be, you know, uh, it wasn't a perfect debut, but it was certainly, you know, way more than not good. You know, I was very happy with the, with the debut. So, yeah. And this, I mean, this is just going to kind of depend on, how back his like secondaries are because the fastball is better than it was. The, the he's ninety seven to one hundred. Um, you know, I know Joe Boyle told us kind of he looked like a top twenty arm last February, and then he blew, and then he blew out. And obviously, the White Sox did the same thing the previous year with Peyton Paulette, and his stuff is not back. You know, his his fastball is not what it was. And there's been some struggles there, but Taylor is kind of like the opposite of that. Some of these guys come back better and stronger, and that's how he's looked so far. Yeah, I was just actually going to bring Paulette up, uh, you know, just because of you know, samesy samesies. Uh, yeah, his stuff has has not come back. You know, the spin rates uh, aren't as good. The the breaking balls aren't nearly as sharp and the velocity hasn't come back. You know, they, they took 
they took the, they, they'd been taking their shots and trying to uh, get some value out of doing that. And it's worked a couple of times and it hasn't worked that one time. So, you know, I'm okay with them taking these risks and trying to get some high, real high upside, you know, with the caveat, you know, the caveat that there could be a very, very low floor in, you know, the fact that they might not get anything out of them at all. Well, I think with, and with Taylor, it just kind of seems, so first of all, he's like bigger than I thought he was. Like he's just looks like a workhorse already. Um, but I think he's even in a decent system that's loaded with pitching. He might be in the top 10 like right now, just cause like he's one of the highest upside arms in the system. And I, you know, I heard, I heard the reports from Arizona, but they've, they've moved him to Canapolis pretty quickly. So they've obviously felt the same way. He wasn't going to get anything out of pitching in Arizona. Speaking of Arizona, uh, do you want to move in move into that a little sure. bit just uh very briefly because uh we don't have any video on that kind of thing and it's kind of uh you know it's kind of like looking at game changer for a little league game you mm -hmm. see that somebody has a single and you really don't know how that single happened you know it could be just that somebody just didn't feel like catching the ball and so they're credited with a single you really don't know but i will say that the white Sox uh are second in batting average and uh second in obp in the ACL. That's pretty awesome. Also uh, second in OPS. Yeah. Pretty good. That's nice. George Wolkow, um, it's like nine games. It's way too many strikeouts. But when he's not striking out, he's doing quite a bit of damage. So he's walking through. He's got a couple of homers. I think Javier Bogayon the same thing. I feel like all of his outs are strikeouts. So even like after a rough start, his numbers look okay. Um, you know, there's just Adrian Heal is probably his name, but it's G-I-L like Gil. He's hitting yeah. like crazy. You know, there's just a whole bunch of DSL guys that are there that are just playing well in Arizona. And there's been some years where there's just no offense at all. So it's good to see. Yeah, pretty happy. And, you know, that we kind of set up like this uh... – you know, like friendship with the prospects worldwide guys, and they've been tweeting video at us and we've been retweeting it. So, you know, if you guys, you know, hopefully you guys are following us on Twitter, but at future socks on, on Twitter, uh, you can see, you know, George Wolkow home run. You can see Javier Mogollon home runs. You can see, you know, all sorts of nice stuff. Steven, uh, Steven Flores catcher prospect is it's, it's nice to, be able to get eyes on those guys, especially since they don't televise any of that stuff. Don't stream any of that stuff, which I absolutely hate uh, because one of the, the real problems I see with that is that we don't ever get highlights of the pitching generally uh, unless it's somebody like Grant Taylor. Like that's the only time that we've pretty much seen footage from Arizona is when he's the one who's pitching. So that's kind of a bummer, but well, as you, and you've kind of said it like, how hard is it to just turn a camera on? You know what? I'm about to show you in in uh, yeah. July because I'm I'm gonna end up in North Carolina. I'm just gonna have a camera, and guess what? Stuff's gonna show up on there. That's it's literally that simple. You know, I I don't understand why it's such yeah. a uh, why it's such a difficult thing. But uh, so I think my my favorite thing about just like the random Wolkow highlights are just that this dude should be a senior at Downers Grove right now. And he is massive. <laughs> like, he's so he's big. Huge. Yeah. He's like six yeah. foot seven. He plays some center field. Um, he kind of looks like Joey Gallo, but he's 18. Yeah. And he is batting right after, after Mogollon, who is like five foot. Yeah. Six. He looks probably. Like a, he looks like a fifth grader. Yes. Yeah. He really does. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Um, uh, what was I going to bring up? Uh, so yeah, we already talked about Iriarte's performance today. Um, do you have any other performance? Oh, I thought you Which were going to go into one of your favorites. Mason Adams. No, Riley, Riley oh. Gowan. Yeah. Oh, Riley Gowans. Oh yeah. He looked awesome today too. Uh, he had a no hitter going into the seventh inning. Um, he gave up 
a single, and he had two walks, struck out 11, uh, looked fantastic. Now that right there, when you talk about the Aaron Bummer trade and, you know, Yes, you got the the Nicky Lopez. Yes, you got uh, your favorite guy, Braden Shoemake. Uh, yes, you got Mike Soroka, who might be a piece out of the bullpen. Beef mentioned him earlier on on Twitter. I saw you know the fact that he's throwing ninety seven miles an hour, fantastic. But Riley Gowans and Jared Schuster, who's also in the pen in Chicago, like those might be the two most useful pieces from that trade for something that. I think everybody hated anyway, because every time they brought him out, nobody seemed to have any faith in him. He had no faith in the defense behind him. And it was just generally always a a bad experience whenever he came out. So uh, at least in the last two years, Uh, and now he's doing that for Atlanta and we might've gotten some useful things for that. Yeah. Riley Gollins is a decent bit of pro scouting, right? That's a, that's a throw in. And I don't think anybody was really expecting much. And he's in the starting rotation. And all we talk about is how loaded the starting rotations are in the minor leagues. And he's cracked one of them. So, yeah, that's pretty decent. Yeah. I mean, when you're following up Noah Schultz from Saturday night as the Sunday starter, and you're going out there and dominating just like he is, it's generally a, a good thing. I mean, granted, you know, I won't quite go there, you know, but uh, he's definitely pitching really well in advanced day. And, uh, you know, you've been able to see him build progressively each start. He's gotten a little better. So it's it's nice to see that he's pushed through the the initial wall that he had when he was with the Braves. Uh, they had him kind of alternating between starting and and relief. And he came here. They put him into a starting role and you know, he's been putting in some, putting in some innings and, uh, been getting better. So there it is. Stole the bummer trade. Ooh, uh, I'm claiming victory on that one already. Cause I'm pretty sure every single Braves fan pretty much hates Aaron bummer by this point. So, um, you have, uh, any particular, uh, performances that you were thinking of on the in the past uh, week that uh, you wanted to highlight here no i mean when i went on espn this week i mean obviously they asked about wilson montgomery and like a timeline type of thing you know and i, I don't really know i, I kind of feel like it'll be after the all-star break no matter what he has to keep doing what he's doing i think there's some obvious hit pool like concerns and questions um but May's way better than April, and he seems to be focused on power and he's getting on base more, and the defense hasn't been an issue, so we'll probably see him. And then I guess the other thing for me is just what they need to see from Jacob Gonzalez to just like kind of hike him up to Birmingham, too. Yeah, I mean, he kind of, you know, after that insane stretch where he was uh, doing really, doing really well for couple of weeks he's kind of cooled down a little bit this week um but you know i mean it could be any any one of a number of things you know he still did get on base here and there so it wasn't like he had a complete and total shutdown this week but uh you know i think that for the most part like the the dash offense did have a bit of a rough time in greenville this week there were a couple of guys that did really well uh being Sean Goosenberg, uh, I think he went 10 for 25 in Greenville this week and uh, had a couple of home runs. Um, And Bryce Willits also had a good week there. But nobody else really had that great of a week. And that's like, uh, you know, Jacob Gonzalez had a great week before that. Uh, Wes Kath had been on a tear as well. You know, it seems like... uh, a bunch of those guys cooled down this week in Greenville. So I'm kind of interested to see what happens in this, uh, this following week. Yeah. And sleepy brings this up. This is, this is definitely something that needs to be addressed. Ryan Galaney for the Kannapolis cannonballers. He's got something like a, a 1037 OPS or something like that. And, uh, he's hitting like three, 
360 or 350 or something. I mean, there's, you know, he's a full, full college guy. So clearly he should be playing in Winston Salem. The only problem is I don't know what to do with him, but that actually brings up this interesting one here is that should we be, should we be worried about Zavala yet? Because Zavala is hitting roughly about 180, 182, something like that. And uh, he's been struggling pretty hard down there. Um, the power hasn't really showed up. You know, obviously, the, the only thing I will say is that his BABIP is extremely low. And when I say low, it's like 220. So if his BABIP is coming in at like 220, that seems to me that that's probably there is some weak contact here, which is obviously going to influence the, the BABIP a lot, you know, as if there's weak contact, of course, the batting average on that ball in play is going to be low because it's slow and right at somebody there. There is definitely some, some of that there. Uh, but to me, it does seem like it's probably a little bit low because when he does hit the ball hard, it has been going at people as well. So, um, I'm not worried yet, but, you know, it's something to keep an eye on for sure. Yeah, so the Galaney mentions interesting. So I know Kevin Burrell a little bit. He's one of the White Sox area scouts. He he brought up Galaney to me this week, just kind of, uh, hey, look at my guy sort of thing. He's doing well. Um, yeah. But I mean, it, like even Caden Connor down there, like those guys just don't belong in low A, but it's hard, right? I think when you're a day three college guy, this is essentially what you have to do to get noticed, right? And it's not really it's not really fair, um, you know, because a lot of these guys rake down there and then you get to the higher levels and then you, like it's, it's kind of a struggle. But there's just, to me, there's no reason to keep them in Canapolis much longer. I know you got to find them playing time, but yeah, this is, they're just, I just think they're too good for the level. Yeah. That's, that's, the, that's really the the question here, right? Is that if, you know, obviously they're too good for Canapolis, but who are they going to bump out of the way to push, to push up and get some playing time? That's the thing. Cause they're not pushing. They're probably not going to push Chris Lanzilli out of the way probably because he's been playing fairly decent up there in Winston Salem. Not going to push Zavala out of the way unless the White Sox see fit that, you know, he's going to, you know, go down and uh, put him back in single A, which he's already proven that he can hit really well at, you know. Um, and then they're not going to bump DJ Gladney either, you know, unless they bump him up at some point. But the thing yeah. is, is that, you know, the performance there has been so-so as well. So it's like, uh, you know, you, these guys kind of have to bump those guys out of the way. And this is uh, a great point. Doug, that I'm going to bring up because I also miss rookie league a lot. Um, granted, you know, this is, uh, you know, a late season thing usually. Uh, but, uh, I do miss the fact that they don't have that because it gives guys like this an opportunity to get more playing time and not have to sit behind people when they get drafted, you know, or when they're too good for the ACL, but not good enough for a ball yet, you could send them and they would go to the great falls Voyagers and they would play for play out there for a couple of weeks and get some, some extra reps in. And, uh, I do miss that a lot. It's unfortunate. Yeah. And it's not like Ryan Galini would be playing in high rookie, but a lot of guys would be and low would be better. So then it would be a better judge of like what some of the guys are, you know, and, that's one of the other things that the area scout really wanted to point out was that he didn't feel like he was first base only. I think that's where he's been playing most of the time though. So, you know, so the white he's first base only, but I think when he was drafted in the foundation of the area scout, like he played both out the corners, he played some third. So maybe that bag and you know, that could be informative if he does move up and he could play some other spots. 
Yeah, I think that that's, uh, you know, that's been happening to quite a few of these guys, you know, is that, you know, they generally profile as corner outfielder guys, but because there's, you know, there's so many guys that they're trying to get playing time that they ended up, they ended up just kind of sticking them at first base and they haven't been drafting first baseman. The only first baseman, like the true first baseman that they've drafted in uh, the last two years is Tim, El- Tim Elko. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, indeed. You got yourself a few extra minutes tonight, but I am going to, I'm going to go ahead and kick it to the last thing here. Uh, are you, uh, do you have anything else for this week? Anything you want to bring up? I, I don't know if I do. I was, you know, I was searching for the Bob Nightingale Sunday notes column because I always do. That's like Sunday morning reading for me because he throws white Sox stuff in there and then it always comes yeah. through. But the only thing he, yeah, so there's a question on it. So the only thing he had this year was something on the draft where he talked to scouts who thought that college players would go like one through eight in the first round. And, you know, with that, I'll say, well, two months out, um, there's eight college names that we've talked about on here pretty prominently, and then there's two prep guys as well. So I I don't know that it's eight college guys, but I think we know who the first nine or ten guys are probably. Yeah, I'm kind of curious, you know, this that's the thing about the drafts, you know, you never know exactly who it is until generally like an hour beforehand, you know, like you'll hear rumblings here and there. So I kind of th- I kind of have a feeling that that's what's probably going to end up happening again is that we'll find out, you know, like any time between like a minute, you know, like an hour to like f- 3 minutes before the the pick is made, you know. Yeah, Keith Law did a mock draft. He had Jack Cagley known um, to the White Sox. He sourced it and said that, you know, they'd kind of been very aggressive with him. Um, but he also mentioned Connor Griffin, too, as, you know, one of the guys that the White Sox had seen it done. So he 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 said it's too early, to, you know, but I think these guys have to do mock drafts, and they do. So Yeah, I mean, I kind of did, like uh... – kind of did some research yesterday on 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 Jack just cuz I was interested. I knew that he was having a better year this year than last, but then when I kind of dove into the numbers, I was like, "Oh, wow, he really genuinely has made some fairly large improvements to his game. Uh his chase rate is way down. Uh his and I mean that's evident when looking at his at his strikeout numbers versus his walk numbers, which last year I think he had like a like a 20, like a, I don't know. It was like a 17, 18% strikeout rate to like a, a 5% walk rate. And this year he's got a 20% walk rate to 10% strike, you know, strikeout rate or something like that somewhere. He he completely flipped it and he's striking out way less, I guess is what I'm saying here. And uh, he does look pretty good this year. Um, but I know that, uh, Doug, Doug will clearly be upset. Says pick a high school player. Please, 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 please. Chris gets, um, I mean, I'm with him. I would prefer a high school player. The only thing that's really going to bother me is first base. So, yeah, fair enough. And like the, the question here, you know, is that yes, they are younger and they have uh, a lot of time to develop just the, the question always is with these prep players is that are they going to take that next step? You know, you, you never hundred percent know for sure. And, uh, you know, at least you have like some track record with the, with the college players. So like I get it, um, from both sides, you know, you want that insane upside. I get it. But if you want that track record, I get that too. So it's tough. Yeah. And I, the two, High school guys that Mike Shirley's taken in the first round. I mean, obviously, it's still a lot of projection, right? Like, it's Colson Montgomery and Noah Schultz. But it looks pretty good so far. So, you know, I think I'd be okay with them gambling again on a, on a prep guy if Mike Shirley's the one making the pick. Yeah, and, uh, you know, when you look at things like George Wolkow, who's drafted way on down the line, uh, he was not drafted in the first round. So, you know, when they're taking risks like, you know, like uh, high risk type picks later on on prep guys that they've worked out a deal with. 
more or less all I'm going to say is that if Mike Shirley and company think that Jack Caglione is the the guy that they think is the biggest talent right there, I'm going to trust them. You know, yes, would I would I prefer a prep guy? I mean, yeah, I would prefer a a, a nice young player, but if they, you know, if these guys make the call and say that that's that's their guy, you know, you have to kind of ride with it. What am I going to say? You know, like they didn't ask me, <laughs> you know, so uh, that's I'm just going to have to trust in that uh, that they're doing good work. And so far from the last couple of drafts that we've seen, things have worked, worked out pretty well. So yeah, and I don't th- I don't think he would be pitching for anybody. So I think you're drafting the bat. I think you're hoping that you could play an outfield corner. But, you know, if you're drafting a bat, if that's the move. And look, I don't even know that he's going to be on the board at five because he's had a really good season. Yeah. I, did he hit any home runs today? I didn't look. Um, I didn't see it on Twitter, and usually I see it if he does. Yeah, I think he had 28 through yesterday. He hit 33 last year, so uh, 28 home runs this year with a completely flipped uh, strikeout-to-walk ratio is uh, – Definite improvement. Nice to see. All right. So you're good for this week. All good. All right, sir. Uh, futuresocks.net. You can find all of our written content. You can find uh, this podcast if you are looking for it there. You can also find it wherever you find your podcast. Uh, if you are listening to this in podcast form, know also that on Sunday nights, usually at eight, not this week, but usually at 8 p.m. on Sunday nights, we are on YouTube and on twitch.tv slash future socks, where you can join us there as well. Uh, there's a Patreon link on futuresocks.net that you can choose to support us uh, and get additional content here and there. And um, also, uh, on our YouTube channel, every night that there is a game, we generally have all of the starting pitchers and home runs from uh, videos uploaded to our YouTube. So that stuff's all on there. Uh, my name is Ian Eskridge at Daily White Sox. He is James Fox at James Fox 917. Uh, we thank you guys so much for your time. Please stop in and see us next week. Uh, Subscribe and like here on YouTube. And uh, we appreciate you so much and have a great night. Thanks. Bye.